Ahoy Hoy Gang, here we are, Season 2, the season when things really start to take off. If this is your first time with us, welcome! And if you're joining us from a previous video, hey, we love to see it. And regardless, I hope you're doing well. Season 2 of Venture Bros is very formative, where Season 1 was setting up the characters, Season 2 sets up the world. From new villains and their dynamics, to new information on factions recently mentioned, here they'll be pulled out of the shadow and into the limelight. How will a series called The Venture Brothers move on after their two protagonists were gunned down on an innocent hoverbike ride? Only one way to find out. This might take a few, but it's time to look at Season 2! The episode opens with a surprisingly upbeat song as everyone seems to be moving on with their lives. Brock digging graves, Jonas Venture Jr. getting prosthetics, 21 and 24 blowing up the cocoon, and Doc running off in the X-1 to travel the world while Brock has to hunt him down. Orpheus is distraught that he couldn't save the boys, and when Brock tranks Rusty at a rave and drags him back, we get our first look at the future of the show. The intro has been adjusted to show off Jonas and Rusty running side by side as the new Venture Brothers! Jonas is much less murderous and way more idealistic with a grand dream of what his father's aspirations were. We also get to meet Doc Staff, a former pro boxer and his old childhood sidekick. Orpheus decides to resurrect the boys while Brock is noticeably nonchalant about the boys being gone. Meanwhile, the Monarch is planning to break out of prison and starts coordinating the prisoners to rise up and overthrow the guards while Phantom Limb bribes them to do nothing to keep Monarch trapped forever so he can keep Dr. Girlfriend to himself. This is 2006. To have this much detail in an animated series at this time is unheard of. To have this much emotion and depth to the characters. Here's Orpheus, the should-be Sorcerer Supreme, racked with guilt and doing everything in his mystical powers to bring the boys back while Triana freaks out. Rusty and Brock don't seem to care, and Rusty really used it as an excuse to just run off and party. Things are not back to how they were at the start of the season. Actions in the Venture Brothers have consequences. And as Orpheus uses his necromancy spell and Rusty teleports himself into a wall, he gets a knock at the door by two half-formed clones of Hank and Dean. That's right, the boys are clones. When you have accident-prone kids, you get them helmets, and when you have death-prone kids, you keep clones around. It's genius, and how they play it off is hilarious. The silent killer bit gets me every single time. It just makes sense in the most morbid and twisted way imaginable, and yeah, of course Orpheus cares about the moral issues, while Doc just doesn't, because he's a man of science who was raised by Jonas. And as King Gorilla defies Phantom Limb's orders and helps Monarch escape prison to be with the one he loves, and the boys start to return to normal, the episode ends. Talk about a great way to start a season. Not only do they explain what's going on, they also build on the world while doing it. Brock and Doc have been through this before. They know what to expect and they know it's not the end at all. The boys have all the same memories thanks to their education beds, which are borderline brainwashing, and there's just plenty of ways to evolve from this jumping off point. Remember the first season was the foundation we're building off of. Now it's time to build up and out. Also, another huge shout out to the voice talent. Doc Hammer and Jackson Public, aka Chris McCulloch, are nailing the myriad of voices they perform, while James Urbaniak is able to riff off of himself as Jonas and Rusty excellently while switching into Phantom Limb with nary a delay. Patrick Warburton is just flawless, absolutely no notes. He brings Brock to life in the best way possible and really helps give him a more human angle. Like, this is how you write a season premiere. This is how you sculpt true and genuine art. Sure, Sure, the animation quality is still improving, but it's night and day with where we were a season ago. Things are only going to go up from here. You know what's not going up though? The Cocoon. In one of the greatest intros ever, we get Henchman 21 out of costume as Gary, and 24 calling him just to be wrapped up into a diabolical three-way with the mighty Monarch, who is sitting in the remains of his burnt cocoon. Monarch demands the rest of the henchmen come back, and 21 and 24 are the only ones available, so they do what any loyal sidekicks would do, they go to the inner city to recruit new members. Gary, being kidnapped as a child by accident and sort of indoctrinated into the Monarch's crew is such a neat touch. And the fact that comics, movies, TV, and everything pop culture related are still more or less the same in this world really adds that extra layer of depth. 
Pogs, Magic the Gathering, Lord of the Rings, etc. are all canon in this world, which makes it so much easier for the dialogue to feel more natural and lived in than having to come up with a whole extra mythos. Sure, things like Giant Boy Detective exist, but by and far, they're few and far between. Anyway, while 21 and 24 are gathering new members, it's Hank and Dean's birthday! And so it's time to celebrate by taking them to the mall! Hank to go shopping with Brock and Dean for his first ever speed suit, all while Monarch stalks Dr. Girlfriend in a giant flying cocoon. The Monarch's new henchmen are armed with actual guns and aren't part of standard guild-issued henching. They're doing their own thing, eventually taking over the cocoon, kidnapping Doc, and shooting Brock. It may not seem like it, but the mall scene is huge. Here, the family's interacting with normal people and shopping in normal locations. They aren't globetrotting to Africa or dealing with some monumental event. They're getting a Nerf football. Brock is buying a sealant gun. The woman at the store has no idea what a speed suit is. This is when the veil starts to get lifted a bit. Sure, there was some back in the Trial of the Monarch, but they very much paint these people as weird for being this into henching and super science. And as they're taken hostage, Phantom Lim uses Brock to storm the cocoon and get back Dr. Girlfriend, who was actually with Hank and Dean the whole time, showing why she's incredibly competent on her own. By and large, she's the reason the Monarch makes any sort of progress in his desire to arch venture. Hate Floats is a perfect way to rebuild after the season finale. It's how you tie up loose ends while still establishing characters and rebuilding everything. You can't have the Monarch just in prison. He needs to be out arching venture. This is how you reset that up. It's a good opportunity to not only get more time with the boys, but also see they're still more or less the same. And it's not like it's forgotten they're clones, it's almost built several times throughout the episode. But a very important thing happens. Brock and Doc treat them like they're the only Hank and Dean out there. Even if they have a clone do-over available, they're still kids and it's still important that they treat them like the originals, even if they're buried in a plot on the complex, which totally won't be brought up ever again. Hate Floats is in a lot of ways another season premiere. It's necessary to watch it directly after Powerless in the Face of Death and really shows that if you blink, you're going to miss something huge in this world. While for the most part there's a good chunk of filler episodes in something like Rick and Morty or Archer, Venture Brothers gets you comfortable and then pulls the rug out from under you. This is when the binge begins. This is where it becomes the most apparent that they are setting up a bigger story. It might be subtle, but the pieces are starting to fall into place. It's the return of Molotov! The episode opens with a flashback to when Brock first joined the OSI and we get the introduction of one of the best characters ever made, Colonel Hunter Gathers, very obviously inspired by the legendary journalist Hunter S. Thompson, a founder of Gonzo Journalism who you'd recognize from movies like Where the Buffalo Roam starring Bill Murray or Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas starring Johnny Depp. He hazes Brock and pushes him further and further until he finally jetpacks off and welcomes him to the Office of Secret Intelligence. The episode then fast forwards to Brock packing up for a special assignment and having Molotov look after the compound while he's gone. Unlike Hate Floats or Powerless in the Face of Death where there's a bunch of smaller stories, here there's really just the A and B story. Molotov babysits and Brock has to hunt down his trusted mentor, Hunter Gathers. That's it. But it gives us so much time with those stories that they have so much more room to breathe. We get to see Molotov genuinely cares for and lusts for Brock. Hank has a crush on her, Doc sees an opportunity, and Dean is terrified of her and just wants to go back to his old life. All while Brock is traversing the Amazon trying to hunt down his teacher as we get assorted flashbacks where he's reminded constantly that no women and no children. Of course, there's some fake outs where he thinks one of his lady companions has been unalive by Hunter, which he was really just asleep and he gets sent into a fury. Like, Brock is a fascinating character. He's a trained weapon, absolutely, but Hunter gave him a code and treated him like a person. He's not barbaric, he's still got a ton of personality, and despite being the bodyguard, he's one of the strongest moral compasses in the whole family alongside Orpheus. He's not afraid to tell Doc when he's made a horrible mistake, and even as they get to the end of the episode and he finally finds Hunter still under anesthetic for a sex change operation, he lets them live. No women, no children. He put his feelings for his mentor over the mission, and while it may not seem like it now, this would have sweeping consequences as the series goes on. I love that Hunter is viewed as some crackpot for pushing these deep conspiracy theories, and Brock in a way just eats it up because, yeah, why wouldn't he? 
their dynamic just really works. The compound stuff is all right. The best part is Hank and Dean not really understanding what's going on, but once Hank gets drugged, I don't know, it feels like the episode kind of drags. Fun fact, Assassin Nanny 911 is a reference to Nanny 911, a nanny reality show from a very weird period in American television. We also get the first introduction of Triana's friend Kim, which is nice, and Molotov's flashbacks with Brock, but overall it's all just fluff compared to the Brock mission. I don't know, there's this creeping chill in the episode that you wouldn't expect. There's this tension that you don't know what's going to happen next, again beautifully brought to life by J.G. Thurwell's outstanding soundtrack. Like, going through American Dad, I knew there'd be episodes I'd have to slog through, and for me, this was the closest I came to a slog episode in this entire rewatch. An episode packed with so much quality and character depth, just juxtaposed with other brilliant pieces, makes it look like a slog in comparison. Assassin Nanny is essential for moving forward, even if you don't realize it on the first watch through. You'd be inclined to skip it if you didn't understand what it was setting up, and even then, it's still just terrific. This is probably the only filler of the season. And even then, it's essential viewing because it's... I mean, it's just perfect. The episode opens with a last time on Escape to the House of Mummies, Part 1. I'm not gonna lie, when I was a kid and got the DVD set for Season 2, I legitimately thought it was a bad copy since it didn't have Escape to the House of Mummies, Part 1, anywhere. Much less the implied existence of Escape to the House of Mummies, Part 3. I was a dumb kid, obviously. Anyway, the family is trapped dealing with a magical cult and take off on a time-traveling adventure to stop them. And when the family gets stuck in a spiked wall trap, Doc escapes determined to save them as he goes back to the compound and gets into a bet with Orpheus that he could shrink anything down better than he could ever do, and yeah, that's the episode. Doc, Pete, and Billy competing against Orpheus to see who could shrink down more, all while Brock, Hank, Dean, and other Brock have to deal with the cult of Osiris. It not only sets up that the Rusty Venture show was a real thing based off Rusty's life as a boy adventurer, but that Billy was a huge fan of it, and you really get to see Rusty and Pete just bonding and laughing. Like, compared to Rick and Morty, Rick has very few friends. He has fewer people that he actually trusts. Doc has friends. He may be abusive to them from time to time, but they're still close, and Venture Brothers takes the time to showcase these relationships. It takes the time to build them up and show off that Rusty is not irredeemable. He is doing his best. The B story is just a fantastic homage to those classic Johnny Quest tropes. They have time travel, costumed henchmen, spiked walls, mummies, everything you could possibly ask for. And even while Doc's contest results at the end of the episode, everyone is still stuck dealing with the Cult of Osiris, which leads directly into Escape to the House of Mummies, Part 3. An episode that obviously never came to fruition, which in and of itself is a terrific joke on its own. And like, I know it's been said before, but it needs to be said again and again, John Benjamin as the master is one of the smartest casting decisions in the history of mankind. The man is one of the best voice actors ever, and I mean, I'm so glad he found mainstream success with Bob's Burgers and Archer, but that's not to say the man doesn't have absolutely legendary skill behind his work and hasn't earned every accolade tooth and nail. I'm not going to drone on, I promise, but Escape to the House of Mummies is just fantastic. It's a filler episode, sure, and that there's very little story elements presented, but it still just has so much character work and high quality jokes that would probably be the best episode I'd recommend if you wanted to see if you liked the Venture Brothers without going too deep. If you're curious about the show or know someone that wants to try it and isn't ready to dive all the way in, dive on in, I think Escape is the best introduction episode. You get everyone's characters, it's just loaded with quick quips, solid references, and ends on a positive yet suspenseful note. It's everything you'd need in an episode and more. And almost like they knew they had to make up for lost time, here we have effectively a story shotgun. It's the night before Rusty's 44th birthday when Brock finds a video left by Jonas Sr. detailing the location of his greatest invention as the family has to set out across the world to gather each piece to put it together before midnight, all while a galactic inquisitor from beyond the stars follows them around and shrieks for them to ignore him. This episode is really something special in that not only is it a massive ensemble story showcasing all the different characters of the last two seasons, but also acts as a bridge for them to all to interact with one another. They 
go to Spider Skull Island to try and steal the first part from Jonas Jr. when they're caught by the ghost pirate captain from the first season, who now works for Jonas. They all agree to work together and go their separate ways to get all the parts to downtown New York City in time. This works as a great vignette episode, where everyone has a bunch of mini-adventures that ultimately culminate with the Venture family coming together to stop the encroaching threat. We have Jonas and the Captain going to see Action Johnny, a drug-addicted version of an adult Johnny Quest, Rusty and Brock going to One Impossible Plaza to try and get Sally to let him in so he can take the piece when Professor Impossible isn't around, Hank and Dean having to go and get a piece from Colonel Gentleman, who they think is unalive when they arrive, and all this is just slathered with references. Huggy, the Impossible Family's robotic helper, a thinly veiled reference to Herbie, the robo helper for the Fantastic Four in the animated series. You get more of Stephen Colbert's brilliant voice acting. There's again this meshing of old world and new age technologies where small real film camcorders and intergalactic teleportation devices are just as believable in the same world. And it's just, yeah. 20 Years to Midnight is not only a terrific story and a great way to show the extended family working together, it still has just those super high quality jokes that build off of the pre-established lore. Like this is not a series you can just jump into anymore. You need to watch from the beginning to get who all these characters are, and it does an excellent job of catching your attention and adding enough new elements that you're curious to see who these people are and how they're first introduced. It's just, when you look at the series and you approach it, it, you can watch this episode on its own, absolutely, but you're only getting half of its weight, half of its impact. It has enough jokes, it has enough references that you can be like, Oh, the Impossible Family is like the Fantastic Four! That's great! Oh, that's a Johnny Quest reference! I understand that! But you don't understand the inner workings of the family. And so it works as both a casual, you catch it on Adult Swim at like 12.30 at night, Oh, I haven't seen the show, but this looks fun! as well as a building off of all the building blocks we've seen before it. And the last bit with the messenger is also just really fantastic and seals the episode brilliantly. Oh boy. Okay, on paper, this episode doesn't seem like a lot, and then it just explodes out of nowhere. After discovering a certain sensual musical starring one Dolly Parton and Burt Reynolds that he has no idea about, Doc has Hank and Dean go out with Triana and her friend Kim from Assassin Nanny 911, while Brock drops them off and gives them dating tips. We get 21 and 24 tagging along as the Monarch and an online date join Dr. Girlfriend and Phantom Limb for a double date, and everyone starts to speculate on how Phantom Limb lost his limbs, with most of the stories focusing around how Billy Quizboy was somehow a part of it. Dr. Girlfriend is tired of seeing Phantom Limb do the boring, uneventful villainy, and so he decides to crank it to a Spinal Tap 11 and take out the Venture Compound to prove he still has it. Brock then has to keep Doc alive as he takes out the Guild Minions and eventually goes after Phantom Limb. This episode is what makes Venture Brothers so great. It starts as a very simple, almost peaceful, the boys are going on a date and so is the monarch! Who wacky hijinks ensue! And then quickly escalates to the compound being under attack and Brock having to go and save the boys covered in blood and ready for war. All because of a bet. I mean, other than the fact we get to see Brock go full-on berserker in a way you don't really get, this episode marries the two settings brilliantly. You feel the awkwardness of the monarch trying to make Dr. Girlfriend jealous, as well as the sense of urgency in Brock trying to do everything to keep the family, his family, safe. The fact the climax of the episode has Brock in a men's bathroom confronting Phantom Limb in a tense yet comedic standoff shows why this show deserves all the love it gets. The violence isn't downplayed or the drama subverted with a joke. You don't have them making these quips as they're going total goblin mode on these people. They know how to hang on these tense moments and to build them up so that when they do have that punchline, it feels earned. Having Doc have to basically stop the blood flow to his arm by putting a Christmas tree holder around it is funny, yet it's also effective and it makes sense for him. The Venture Brothers earns every laugh it gets out of you, and even if you don't get a joke, they know you'll probably pick it up on the next one. The show wasn't made for you. The show was made as a passion project, and they're not going to water it down for people to get every bit of it, but the more you get, the funnier it becomes. 
Venture Brothers really is one of the weirdest and most surreal animated series out there in what it's willing to do. I could never imagine another show doing a plot like this even half as well. It just, it's baffling to me that they would go this far and we're barely halfway through the season. And even then, it doesn't necessarily feel like there are consequences to this episode, but it's still gripping. It builds Phantom Limb as a growing force. We've seen him ever since the first season have this sort of impact, be a higher rank guild operative than the monarch but now we're actually seeing that he commands an army we're seeing that he is able to be a threat to brock to doc to the boys and that he's not afraid to get violent when he needs to something that will be played on much much later surprisingly not a filler episode but definitely feels like a much needed breather episode after victor echo november after coming back from a costume contest dressed as Chewbacca, Princess Leia, Old Ben Kenobi, and the Bat, the family flies over Underland, which is smaller than Detroit in northern Michigan, where they are taken out of the sky by Baron Von Underbite, who will finally have his revenge on Doc for blowing up his jaw. Reminder, he didn't do it. However, as they're taken hostage, Dean in his Princess Leia costume is taken to the Baron to become his bride, while Hank, everyone's favorite little bat boy, and the rest of the family join the Unterground, led by Cat Clops and, and girl German bad guy leader, to stop the wedding and take down the Baron once and for all. It's simple, and it works because of it. Doc makes references to the boys being clones and is much more nonchalant about them unaliving, compared to Brock who genuinely seems to care despite knowing that they can be somewhat easily replaced. It's a sweet touch that he really does care about them, and seeing Hank come into his own is just terrific. They've learned how to write him perfectly, and it warms my heart to see him so actualized. Hank is the guns a blaze and never say die boy wonder, and he has so much time to just shine in this episode. I mean, his dialogue is the best he's had yet, he's making references like the wallflower, and it just, it makes him so almost relatable. With his, like, his mask slit comments, it just feels like he's a more actualized character. You you understand Hank because you know people that act like Hank. Again, it doesn't seem like much, but all these small touches bring the world more and more together. By the end of the episode, the Baron is kicked out of Underland, girl German bad guy leader is put in charge, and Underland has a bright future ahead of it while the Baron has to sleep on the monarch's couch. It doesn't need to be more than this, and while it's very obviously a satire of Doctor Doom and Latveria being a tiny nowhere country, it still works as its own joke. I mean, the eunuchs are terrific, there's still phenomenal performances all around, and just, yeah. Love Bites is the perfect exhale episode with tangible consequences before we lead directly into introducing one of the greatest teams ever formed. The episode opens with a video from the Guild of Calamitous Intent, where Watch and Ward congratulate Dr. Orpheus and team on being chosen to get their own supervillain. Obviously a parody of sales videos, this intro actually gives a great background on why an organization like the Guild matters. This is a world where superheroes, super scientists, and super government organizations all interact and intersect. This is a world where somewhere like Underland exists without anyone thinking twice. There's going to be villains and they're going to have lofty ambitions. The Guild exists as a mediator, as a way to make sure they don't go too far and break an already delicate system. They set up treaties, curb inappropriate behavior, and most importantly, make sure a villain is the right fit for who they've been assigned. They want to make sure power levels match to give both parties the challenge they deserve. It's just such a neat design that could only work in a world like this. Don't think too much on it, don't worry about it, but just appreciate the level of thought that's gone into this world that the guild has gone from being just mentioned here or there to actually having a tangible mission statement. They're just another organization. Of course, next season we'll introduce the council proper, but having this episode is super necessary for everything that comes afterwards. Anyways, yeah, Orpheus has to put together a team and pick his arch-villain today! Meanwhile, Doc has the family figuring out what his walking eye should be able to do to entice the government to buy it, all while Guild Wasp are landing on the compound to set up the interview process. 
Dr. Orpheus Astral projects to get his two most trusted compatriots, Al the Alchemist, played by the incredible Dana Snyder, and Jefferson Twilight, Blackula Hunter, played by Charles Parnell, who you'd most likely recognize from Top Gun Maverick. The three of them then go through their roster of potential villains, while Hank and Dean have to entertain Triana until she's whisked away to the Torrid Zone by the evil spellcaster, Torrid. Not only is this a terrific introduction to Al and Jefferson Twilight and their dynamic with Byron, it builds the world and sets up how the guild operates. On top of showing just how petty Doc can be when he sends the walking eye out to try and get the villains to arch him instead because he's just a wee bit jealous. We also get another appearance of Sergeant Hatred in the background, though he doesn't have any dialogue yet, and it's just, yeah, it stands on its own, but also builds on what was before it. Yes, I'm nerding out. No, I don't care. It's my video. But just this attention to detail was not common, and I'm going to keep saying that until it rings home. The series was ahead of its time, and it's blasphemy it doesn't have more love, especially when they're putting so much thought into an otherwise ancillary element. You would have just thought that, oh, Phantom Limb and Monarch and Baron Von Underbite are just bad guys that like arching Dr. Venture, because Johnny Quest didn't necessarily have an established villain league, but here they're actually justifying it. Here they're giving a reason and a purpose to it and as we explore more into it in season three and it makes more and more sense yeah of course they have a system like this in place otherwise you have a bunch of villains running around with no code no understanding of rules and they'll just start making absolute chaos the guild is a necessary evil in that it keeps the villains under control it keeps them from overacting it makes sure that there is a balance of power so you don't have super powerful villains wiping out here heroes and super powerful heroes just decimating villains. It's necessary and this episode does a beautiful job of establishing it. Oh gee, and then we have guess who's coming to state dinner, which is just more peak. Oh no, I'm swimming in peak over here. Somebody throw me a life raft. As Gargantua 1 starts to careen into the ocean, Bud Manstrong struggles to keep the ship together as it burns up in the atmosphere. Anna tragically doesn't survive the crash landing. But that doesn't matter, because our little boy scout Bud is a hero who's going to be celebrated at the White House, and the Ventures are invited! And so yeah, the Ventures go to the White House, and wacky hijinks ensue. Doc is determined to get time alone with the president. Everyone thinks Bud is going to Manchurian candidate the president. Bud's mom wants to sleep with Brock. Oh, and Hank and Dean have to get $5 bills together in order to give the ghost of Abraham Lincoln a physical form to stop another president from having their own theater moment. I, I love Abraham Lincoln in this episode. Just that whole penny for his thoughts. It's just, there's such a charm. Even the president is done incredibly well. Like it's, it's this weird mishmash of like a Clinton character and a Bush character. And it's just like, how can you make the most weird, awkward, uncomfortable president and yet give him this charisma this exuded confidence and you have manhauser again the episode is terrific like that's that's the quick and easy of the episode is it the most important episode ever made no hardly but it's still great to see the family having their own adventures and i really love this episode for hank and dean it's just such a G. Willikers feel for an otherwise serious situation. Jakey's gang, we gotta help the ghost of Abraham Lincoln save the president. I don't know. With the revelations they have to deal with in the next few episodes, as well as everything that happens to them, in hindsight, this episode really is one of the last times they're just Hank and Dean boy adventurers. It's not a send-off of that idea at all, and they'll still always be Hank and Dean, but after this, there's definitely some of the sparkle washed away. They become much more aware of their own reality and their own mortality. I also just really love the president and General Manhauser in general, as they will make some appearances later on down the road. It's a wonderful episode that shouldn't be skipped, and honestly, while the tone is a little bit different compared to the episodes before and after it, it does feel fully figured, fully fleshed out. It feels important. While there are some elements that you may find uncomfortable, overall, it is a great episode worth checking out. Exhibit A 
The episode opens with a cocoon hovering in front of an accounting firm and then raining fiery hell down upon unsuspecting financial advisors as the monarch and his henchmen storm out having attacked the wrong place and having to bail after stealing office supplies, all while Doc gets possessed by an Oni and has to have Orpheus help him with his little problem. Meanwhile, Hank and Dean are training to get their driver's licenses in when they're ambushed and kidnapped by a woman pretending to be passed out in the middle of the road. The woman being a former bodyguard of Doc's and an American gladiator named Myra who thinks she's the boy's mother. While kidnapped, Hank reminds Dean of the time they were kidnapped by Sergeant Hatred and taken to the hover tank and how he did some things that we're going to talk about later on. But yeah, he, he did some messed up things to the boys that Hank has yet to forget. And so Brock and Helper go to get the boys back. The cocoon is whipped into shape by the wide-hipped, black-drip-wearing doctor himself, Dr. Henry Killinger and his magical murder bag, all while Doc and Orpheus get dragged to a motel by the Oni and start to fight. Dr. Killinger is just great. He's such a wonderful character that just gets the monarch back on the right track for no discernible reason other than he wants to help. He brings back Dr. Girlfriend and shows her how much the monarch really cares about her, all while being a genuinely creepy looking guy, obviously based off Henry Kissinger. And I mean, to have 21 suspicious of him, to not know if he can be trusted, while 24 is just obviously all in on it, it really kind of shows how 21 is loyal to the monarch. How after all these years, after even being kidnapped, he still looks up to him and doesn't want his life that he's become so familiar with sort of taken over and changed by a total stranger. The monarch has a competent crew and Killinger flies off into the sunset, his mission a success. And on the surface level, the episode does a brilliant job of just being a fun watch. But if you dig deeper and look at the episode in the grand scheme of things, everything that happened in this episode will be called back to in some fashion, and it's actually a big part of setting up the finale that we're going to lead into. With the Monarch and Dr. Girlfriend reuniting, Hank and Dean being a little bit more aware of their mortality, even bringing up... Hank's memories of what Sergeant Hatred did to them. You get Brock and Helper having great chemistry and really showing off how Helper is a wonderfully written idea. He speaks in beeps and boops, but it's how they have orchestrated it, how they have provided him this voice and the, the shrieking. It makes him feel wholly realized. It makes him feel like he's complete. And I just, I love that. I love every member of the Venture family, and even just having Doc and Orpheus go through this over and over again. This is like the fourth or fifth conflict they've had this season, and it really shows that clash between science and magic, and it works, because they don't necessarily hate each other. Orpheus just very obviously hates that Doc doesn't have the morals that he has. He doesn't have the humanism, which is greatly exemplified in the next episode. The last great exhale before one of the biggest events of the show. The episode opens through the eyes of one of the Monarch's henchmen raiding the Venture compound, saving Private Ryan style. When he runs into Brock, understandably, he does not make it. Doc, in an attempt to play God and wanting a healthy government contract, reanimates the corpse and creates Venture Stein, the potential future of military technology. All while Brock actually has a crisis of faith, eating across from a man he took the life of, who isn't brought back and cognizant, but is a genuine, bona fide, reanimated corpse, a la zombie. Orpheus confronts him about it and encourages him to join in his spiritual gathering with some friends at his place. And while all this is going down, some plucky 20-something teenagers, the Groovy Crew, stop their van at the complex and decide to go in and look for a mystery to solve. Yeah, that's right, it's a dark, twisted version of the Scooby Gang, each inspired by different famous psychopaths. And so yeah, the gang raids the compound while Hank and Dean go looking to see if the compound is haunted, and wacky hijinks ensue! Turns out the gang is actually responsible for one of the uses of the sets of clones. And as Brock tries to settle his turbulent mind, we get a giant hunter rising from the sea of his dreamscape like a big-breasted Gogeta and tells him he's going to Secret Service Heaven, which is even better than normal heaven because it's full of secrets and espionage. It's a nice touch to have Brock struggling with his identity and coming face to face with Doc actively cheating death and not being okay. He loves his family, he loves Hank and Dean, and he wouldn't fight so hard if he didn't want to keep Doc safe, but that doesn't mean he agrees with everything he does. 
He's not a machine, and it's funny that in a way, Hank and Brock are the moral core of the family. And as the groovy gang chases down Hank and Dean, they fall into the clone lab, and Hank and Dean start to freak out until Rusty tells them they're their personal servants and that they were going to be a birthday surprise. The clone room is massive, and it's telling how many clones he had prepared and ready to go that they need to pop them into the re-education beds. I will say, having Vengerstein in the learning beds really shows the militaristic uses of the things that Rusty and then later Hank and Dean used as they grew up. The learning beds being a way to brainwash and flood people with information in their sleep. Hover bikes can hover over mines. You have the floating shoes. You have reverse heelys. There's so many items that make you realize how Rusty may not have had the greatest childhood that everyone seems to idolize around him, except for him. And now, Hank and Dean are starting to become aware of their clones. Brock makes peace with his decisions, and as he drives Venturestein into the sunset to party, Doc has fresh bodies to use for his research. What could possibly go wrong? Dr. Girlfriend and the Monarch have been sneaking around behind Phantom Limb's back, and so, tired of being just a motel hookup, Dr. Girlfriend threatens to cut the whole thing off, and the Monarch proposes to her to keep her around. There's a time skip, and next thing we know, somehow, the Monarch's henchmen have captured the Venture family on the Monarch's wedding day, despite the fact that Dr. Girlfriend strictly demanded he not arch Dr. Venture anymore. Welcome everyone to the showdown at Cremation Creek. Our intro plays over the Monarch going to Phantom Limb to get some of Dr. Girlfriend's things while he hunts down the villains the Monarch was in prison with earlier in the season, having broke them out and picking them off one by one. Obviously not taking the infidelity well. Meanwhile, the Ventures are scattered throughout the cocoon as part of the groomsmen, with Hank putting on an old henchman costume akin to the outfits they wore in the pilot. Rusty confronts Dr. Girlfriend after recognizing she was the woman he kissed in Midlife Chrysalis back in Season 1, and Brock actually just is a really responsible usher who organizes everything and gets all the villains, from Truculees to Sergeant Hatred in their seats, before he's confronted by the greatest villain of all. The leader of the guild, the Sovereign himself, David Bowie, with his two sidekicks, Iggy Pop and Klaus Nomi, obviously named after, you know, Iggy Pop and Klaus Nomi. Everything seems to be going well. Hank even gets seated next to Sergeant Hatred, who doesn't recognize him with his disguise on, and he even references what Hatred had done in the past. And as Dr. Killinger is about to finish the ceremony, a swarm of guild wasps attacks the cocoon, with the phantom limb at the helm. And like, that's that's the broad strokes of this episode of an animated comedy on Adult Swim, the channel previously known for a group of fast food items living in Jersey or a space-based superhero having an unhinged talk show. Like, that's not even touching the sleepover that Orpheus, Jefferson, and Al throw to try and figure out how to be a better team, which isn't even a minor plot point, it's just, yeah, this is a part one of a proper two-part season finale, and it's wild that it's happening at all. It would actually start a tradition going forward of two-part conclusions for the next couple seasons, it cements why the Venture Brothers is a cut above what was traditionally allowed on television at the time. Remember, this is still around that 2006 period. This is not common. And so, after a very brief catch-up, we're thrown right into the action with Brock leading a militia of butterfly wing soldiers and Hank, Rusty and Monarch escaping the damaged cocoon while Phantom Limb takes out the Sovereign and kidnaps Dr. Girlfriend as he plans to take his spot at the head of the guild of Calamitous Intent, and that all of his schemes have been leading up to this moment where he would take his rightful place. It really puts Phantom Limb as an antagonist into perspective. He couldn't care less about the ventures or anything that's been going on. Sure, he's not a fan of the Monarch, but his goal has always been to take out the Sovereign. Victor Echo November showed how deadly he was, how scary he could be when he had that full power at his disposal. The trial of the Monarch was just showing how he could wipe things under the bridge. He is a very clever man. He is a very scary man because he is so smart. Dean, meanwhile, is hallucinating in the engine room of the cocoon and going on a wild adventure alongside everyone's favorite giant boy detective that he imagines as Billy Quizboy, and all the other characters are just interpretations of the real-life people he interacts with, with his dad being a rat. It's subtle, but the cracks are starting to show. Hank and Brock help fight off the Guild Wasps, Sovereign takes out his traitorous and musically talented guards, and Orpheus and the gang fly in to save the Ventures and the day, while Monarch and Doctor Mrs. the Monarch drift off in their escape cocoon. Like, that's... 
that's how you end a season. You set up new beginnings, wrap up the season Big Bad in Phantom Limb, who had proper setup in the previous season, and you feel like there's some kind of conclusion even with Dr. Mrs. the Monarch dropping an unknown bombshell at the end of the episode. You have Dean vocalizing how he's scared of going on adventures and is tired of being chased around, Hank confronting the reality of their positions, Doc just along for another ride, and Brock teaching, training, and loving Hank like a real person knowing full well he's a clone. 21 and 24 are fantastic. Orpheus and Pals are terrific. The jokes are next level. And just following the tempo you'd expect of a show like this, you have a long exhale as you prep for the next season. Everything feels like it served a purpose, even as the cocoon smolders in the middle of the canyon. And that's it. That's season two. Where season one was building the characters, season two was all about building the world and the webs of connections. We got a ton of new characters introduced and we saw them all doing their best to obtain their personal goals. To quote Doc Hammer and Jackson Public, the series is about failure. It's about everything falling apart. And I think that's what makes it so entertaining and yet gripping. We all fail. But it's rare for a show to confront that reality to confront that maybe we won't succeed at everything we set out to do. That the age of space exploration may come to a flaming halt as a space station careens into the sea. That you can have everything figured out to take over and still be overtaken by a bunch of guys in butterfly costumes. Failure is not something to fear. Failure is not something that you should run from. It's something to learn from, to grow from. And here you see characters constantly growing and getting a little bit better, a little bit stronger, and a little bit closer to not always failing. You see characters recognize they live in the shadow of others, and even if you didn't notice it, I bet your brain did, Hank and Dean survive till the end of the season. Even with the freedom to effectively wipe them out episode after episode a la Kenny and South Park, they don't because it takes away that weight of death. It takes away the weight of loss. The more times they get brought back, the less you might connect with them. So each one is held very close to the chest. Will they make it out alive or won't they? You had Hank thrown into a bunch of guild wasps with Brock, and when Brock needed to throw somebody into a wasp to take it down, he didn't throw Hank even though he knew he was replaceable, he threw some random grunt. Now that may not seem like much, but it shows that he treats them like humans. That Hank and Dean mean more to him. Am I reading too much into it? See, I don't think so. With something like, say, American Dad or Family Guy, yeah, probably. Probably way more than I need to. But with the Venture Brothers, the more you watch, the more you go back with a fine-tooth comb and recognize all the different build-ups and all the different moments that have a lot more weight later on. Remember the blinking of the problem light on Gargantua 1? Remember the speculation around how Phantom Lim got his powers, or Venture Stein? These may not seem like important things right now, even just glossed over, but as time goes on, they'll matter more and more. Now, whether that was intended or just them circling back on the ideas, I genuinely have no idea, but it's still incredible to see how intricately woven the show is. We're over a quarter of the way through the series, and we've only covered two seasons. There's so much more I'm excited to go over, and I just want to thank you all so much for giving me this chance to gush about one of my favorite series of all time. The Venture Brothers really is something special, and I do hope that if this is your first introduction to the series, you do pursue it through legal means and experience this brilliance for yourself. However, that's going to do it for this season's retrospective. Anything I was wrong on? Right on? What was your favorite episode? Least favorite? Let me know in the comments below. And if you liked what you saw, make sure to like, comment, share, and subscribe. Tell your friends we're out here always spreading that good word. And like always, thank you so much for being you. Thank you so much for watching. Keep fighting that good fight, and I'll see you next time as we flee into Season 3! Goodbye, everybody!